Hallelujah. You may be seated. There's something to find in this service. There's something to encounter. I welcome you to the house of your King and your God. And I want you to do everything you can to, to hear me because the Bible declares that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as long as you can hear me, I want you to be non-distractible. As long as you can hear me, I want you to keep your focus on the Lord because of the things that the Lord has for us. Amen. I said hallelujah. We don't look like we're in the house of kings. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, we've been on a journey, a spiritual journey, a powerful spiritual journey. And the journey is based on a word we've received from the Lord that certain people will find things that have been hidden for decades, hidden for seasons, hidden in darkness. And because we believe, we are those that believe in the word of the Lord, we fear him and we believe in his word. We have taken the, the Lord by his word and we have started our exploration. There's been incredible testimonies about many discoveries in the spirits that a lot of people have begun to enter into and permit me to use the word stumble on because of the prophetic word. But we thank God it's a, sun, it's a month of five Sundays. So one thing is for sure, even if you haven't begun to experience those things yet, that's why you're back into the presence of the Lord and this service is your service in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll read a scripture that will form the backdrop of the conversation. I come in the wine skin of a Bible teacher. And so if you have a thing, if you have a heart for the word of the Lord, I want you to listen. And I want you to listen with the ear to do the things that you hear. I want you to listen with the heart, the aptitude, the desire to apply and to live life by the things that will be said. The word of God to us this morning is to lead by. It's not just to accumulate in notes and in our mind. It's actually for life and for godliness. And the Lord had begun to emphasize to me that it's time for us to move from the impartation prophetic dimension into the strategic teaching dimension because if you would if you study the lives of anybody who to whom the word of the lord that was spoken came to pass they were never people who waited on prophecy they were always people who warred with prophecy and so the word of the lord doesn't come to pass because god said it the word of the Lord does not come to pass because of how God said it or through whose lips God said it. Because if you know anything about God, God does not have the capacity to lie. And that's a very instructive thing. It's not as if God will not lie. He cannot lie. So if he gives you a word, whatever happens or doesn't happen to that word, God still cannot lie. Because God is spirit. So when he speaks, his word creates spirit matter. And as long as God's word has created it in the spirit, even if it does not arrive in your experience, God didn't lie. Because his words are not predictive, they are creative. You study how man was made, you notice in scripture, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, that man was made twice. First, by the words of God, the thoughts of God, the Logos, in the realm of the Logos. But you see God also bending down into the earth in Genesis chapter 2 to form man out of the dust of the earth. Which means that everything God makes happens twice. In Genesis 1, he made man and 
He blessed what he had made, but there was nothing on ground because his spirit, his words are spirit and they are life. If he stopped there, he had fulfilled the demands of the speaking word of God. But after he spoke with his mouth and made man, in fact, male and female, and blessed them and gave them dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over everything that creeps upon the face of the ground, we see God still showing up in a garden that he made on the eastern side of Eden, and he bent into the earth to form man out of the dust of the earth. So the question is, which man was formed when God spoke? Which man emerged when God bent? You must understand that the moment God says a thing, it has already come to pass. Because it has been available in the realm of the spirit where God is. So whether you experience it in material reality or not, God cannot lie. Which means the second time that it happens, where it happens in your life is up to you. When God speaks, it already happened. That's the difference between God and a prophet. A prophet says what will come to pass. God says what he has already done. If he has not done it, he does not declare it. The moment he says it, it's done. I always use the analogy, the, uh, the powerful analogy of this movie, this good old movie many of us have watched. I think it's Bruce Almighty. I think so. That's the movie. Where a man was given an opportunity to take an interview with God and ask him tough questions. And in that interview, he stood before God and he wanted to check, he wanted to test omniscience. He wanted to test how truly all-knowing this God is. And so he looked at God and says, um, your next test is, I'm going to put my hand behind my back and I'll set it to a particular number. And you tell me what number is, is behind my back. And if you can do that, it means I can trust you with any other thing you say because it looks like you have knowledge that is transcendent. It is true when they say that you, you know it all. And so he put his hand behind his back and he said, what numbers do I have? And God said three. And he brought his hand out and it was three. He was like, hmm, fair enough. What are the odds? There are five fingers, three. You don't need too much guessing to get that. Then he changed the number and asked God, what number do I have? And God said one and he brought his hand out. It was one, I said, fine, okay. Let's take one last time. And he said, God, what number do I have in my hand? And God said six, and he was so in a hurry to finally catch God and tell God, God is a liar. So he hurriedly brings his hand out and says, you were close because he had five. And God said six, and in his mind, a spirit does not know that human beings have five fingers. He has easily forgotten. And he wanted to prove to him that there cannot be, it's not only that I did not choose five, it cannot be six. It's not only that I didn't choose six, but it cannot, it is not within the numbers that are, six is not on the list. You have picked a choice on the multi, you have, you have circled something that does not exist. <laughs> they gave you one to five, you circled six. And he was in a hurry to prove to him that that option does not exist on the list. And the moment he brought that hand forward, a, a, a six finger grew out. And he screamed and shouted and was wondering what was in his hand. And the lesson was clear. He'll never forget it. And every one of us who watched the movie will never forget it. That when he speaks, he doesn't speak as one who predicts. He is God. He speaks as one who creates. That's what takes from him the capacity to lie. Because even if it didn't exist, the moment he leaves his mouth, creation brings it forth. Anybody whose words can create cannot lie even if they tried. Because their words are not based on what is available. Their words in itself have inherent power to create whatever they say. How do you make that person lie? And so every time you get a word, a, a word from the Lord, 
It's a month of accessing hidden treasure. I don't want you to go back to God looking for God to fulfill his word. Because everything God does, he does twice. First in the realm of God, the realm of the spirit. And then in the realm that you want to have it. So when you go back to God, the correct, the accurate posture for those who will see the word of the Lord come to pass is to first thank him that he spoke it. Because he's not a predictor. He is creator. And that faith, the ability to sustain the revelation that if he left his mouth, it's already available in the realm of the spirit. The Bible says that we are blessed with all spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. The moment you catch the revelation that God has already secured and procured for you, all that you need to find not just what is on the surface, but reach into the deep and find hidden treasures that solve naughty problems in your family, in your workplace, naughty problems that have lingered in the family, naughty problems that have defied many things, prayer and fasting, and all kinds of patterns playing out that are against the will of God for your life. If you would dare to believe that if he said it, it is done, then you are on your journey to having what you say. The Bible declares that what things soever ye Desire when you pray, believe that you have it. It says then that you receive it. Beg your pardon. Then it says you will have it. So everything God gives comes twice. You first have it, you first receive it, then you have it. Many people are hoping to receive things that they don't have faith to believe they already have. One thing soever you desire when you pray, believe. The first goal of prayer is to come in thanksgiving, which is the acknowledgement that there's nothing I'm about to ask that he's hearing for the first time. The acknowledgement that there's nothing I desire that I'm just going to inform him in this prayer. That this prayer is not an attempt to inform God. It is first to celebrate that if he clothed the lily of the field, That if he had done Solomon in all of that glory, and he still could not be compared with the glory of the lily of the field, that even if all the Gentiles seek it, I know that my father knows. I already know that my father knows. Hallelujah. So who, who has received hidden treasures already? Yes. So the journey we are on is not to force God, bend his hand with spiritual exercises to make him do what he said or seed sowing. No. The purpose of our engagement is to say, Lord, if he left your mouth, the same mouth that created the universe in six days, does not have the capacity to talk and universe, the universe does not respond. We know it is already available in the realm. We have come. Give us the eyes that see it. Give us the hands that can apprehend it. Give us a heart, a heart of courage that can insist that it doesn't matter what's prevailing around because God said it, it has already been given. I have already received it, therefore I must have. This is the meaning of from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. They take it by force because they already see that it has been released. It's because it has already been released that there is a taking and a forceful taking. And in the name of Jesus, I decree and I declare on the strength of the word of God that has already proceeded, if your amen will thunder in this house, the treasures that are requisite for your destiny to enter into the next phase and the next quantum leap, in the name of Jesus, the words of God will cause you to see it. The words of God will cause you to receive it. And in the name of Jesus, you will have it. Lift one hand and say, I will have it. Say, in the name of Jesus, I will have it. I receive it in the spirit. Therefore, I will have it in the natural. I receive it in the spirit and I will have it in the natural. Say one more time. I receive it in the spirit. I will have it in the natural. Say, amen. amen. This is how we approach God about his word. We approach it knowing that everything he says, everything he does, he does how many times? What that does is it eliminates the tendency of murmuring from your prayer. 
You will never murmur and complain. You will never ask God silly questions if you know that what you are approaching him about that he said was already finished in a realm. The problem is that the realm is much higher than the realm of your experience. But it's a realm that you live. It's a realm of the spirit. It will be impossible to sustain this revelation and come into the presence of the Lord and murmur and complain. Complain about what? You're asking God to do what God has already done. It's a ridicule of a renewed mind. It's a ridicule. It's proof that your mind cannot really first apprehend that the one you speak to is spirit and in his realm, all his word is finished. Forever, oh God, your word. Settle. Settle. So you must, you must correctly understand what the journey is about so that you don't beg God about his promise. It's a proof of the unrenewed mind to be anywhere after John the Baptist and beg God. It's time for forceful collecting. Those who beg God, they lose seasons. They lose time. The, the patient dog does not eat the fattest bone again. Does it? The, the, the fattest bone does not belong to the patient dog. <laughs> that dog will go hungry. Yes. It's, it's fattest bone for patient dog that made the man at the pool wait 38 years. Go and ask him. Oh God, you've been here so long. What's your theology? What's the theology to support your presence here for so long? In the middle of many miracles that have happened for 38 seasons. And you're still here. He said, it's the patient dog. I am the patient dog. And I'm hoping that the fattest bone will come to me. Why didn't we all sit down at home and hope that all the books we read in school will enter our head? Why did we go hard in academics? Why did you finish school and still go and do short courses? Why didn't you just hope that if you sat down and you're, and you're a sincere person and you just want to do right, by some magic, everything you need to know will just, it will, you will just suddenly know because your heart is right before God. We're in the season where if we will give birth to the things God has already said, we must allow strategy to collide with prophecy in our lives. Write it down. This is the problem and the pain of the Nigerian and largely the African church. We have people who have excelled in prayer that do not believe in strategy. And they have found routes to excuse the need to be strategic on the altar of prayer. As if the proof of faith is that you do not work. They found a way to say things like, God is in control. God is in control? That's where your prayer ends? God really... God is in control. God is in control. If God is in control, will, will, will 280 plus kids be abducted in Kaduna? God is in control. That, that's, not, that's not the kidnapping of two or three people. Do you know how many buses you need to kidnap 280? How you traveled from town into the bush? 200, some schools don't have up to 280 students. How you vanished and nothing happened. God, God is in control. Go to the place where God is in control and check if there are doctors there. The Bible says that the heavens of the heavens are the Lord, the earth he has given to the children of men. So you want to know where God is in control? Heaven. You want to know where you are in control? Earth. God is in control. It's a religious, demonic way to excuse the need for action on the fact that there is a sovereign Lord. Whereas he has divided his realm and he has put a good head on your shoulder and he has given you the same kind of sovereignty that he has. You are made of the very same matter God is made of. That's what it means to have this treasure in earthen vessels. God is in control, it's true, but it's also not true. 
God is in control in your life. God is not in control in our world because God is only in control in heaven. When you receive Jesus, heaven found his home in you. So if it is about the matters of your life, that's heaven because you are in heaven. You are a citizen of heaven. So about your life, yes, God is in control. About your territory, no. God is not in control. You are in control. You were sent as a vice regent. You were released as an ambassador. Heaven sent you to go and control the earth on their behalf. The statement that God is in control when you were given responsibility is treason to majesty. God is not in control. (laughs) When it's time for spiritual warfare, God is not in control. When it's time to apply the word of God, God is not in control. Get it out of your head. You don't need it. It will keep you in circles too long. Yes. When it's time to look challenges in the face and speak to a mountain, God is not in control. Because he warned us when we stand before mountains, he said, don't pray to me. Talk to your mountain. That's what Jesus told them. A demon came and attacked them and they tried to cast it out and they couldn't cast it out because they were praying to God in front of a demon. And they went to Jesus. Why couldn't we cast out this devil? Jesus said, you... You, <laughs> you are not aware that when you stand before an opposition, your prayer is not supposed to be to God about the opposition. Your declaration is supposed to be to the opposition about the size of your God. That's what the oppositions fear. That's what they see and tremble. You must be a, an accurate representative of the God you say you believe in. I can tell you many stories about it, but many of us, we have thrown away our opportunity to, to demonstrate dominion on that, that, that truth. God is in control. That is not always correct. It is the context that determines if it is correct. And I'm saying these things to provoke your heart to know that there are certain things that you have prayed about, but the mere decision to stop at prayer and not apply strategy in that situation is failure before God. It is how we abort the moves of God. Those who fulfill destiny are both people of prophecy and people of strategy. The revolution, the revolution that a nation like this nation, in case you're watching from anywhere around the world, the revolution that your nation, our nation needs to move into the thing that is promised in scripture where it says that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice, will require more than prayer. The purpose of prayer, when we're looking for an economic revolution, we're looking for a political revolution, we want to see God fulfill his word, we need more than prayer. The purpose of prayer is to set the foundation. Prayer is not in the equation of breakthrough. Prayer is in the equation of revelation. The purpose of prayer is to forge in your heart a conviction with which you will go and do what God said. There's a way in which you feel, there's a way in which if you consider prayer to be the route to breakthrough, you will talk to God and leave it with God. But when you understand that the purpose of prayer is revelation, then what happens is that you meet God to give you the secrets for breakthrough. You don't meet God for breakthrough. He prepared everything and put you in. There is a system for breakthrough on the earth that he designed for you. You go to him to get keys. You don't go to him to open the door. Have you noticed that God, God, God has promised many people comfort, but he has never given anybody a chair. When God promises you to comfort, he gives you wood. He's never given, I've never seen a chair come out of heaven because God promised you a comfortable life. Even if you had a dream that your sitting room suddenly changed and a fantastic settee came in and it was by the word of, even if I entered your sitting room and saw your settee and said, by the word of the Lord, in the name of Jesus, in 24 hours, there will be, there will be Louis Vuitton in your dining room. And you screamed amen and you held on to the prophetic. I hope you know that if you were to meet God where God gives Louis Vuitton, he, he will take you to the forest. It's wood. When he gave wood, he, oh, 
When he gave us trees, every prophecy for Louis Vuitton was already fulfilled. Yes. And so we have believers that are going to God for comfort and say, give me chair, give me chair. God says, no, I give raw material, I give you wood. You change wood to chair, a spirit of strategy. And so the longer we pray, if our mindset is wrong, the longer we pray, the less strategic we become. Our prayer now drives us into a state of idleness and laziness because our prayer is not going to God for revelation. We are going for breakthrough. And so because we have breached the correct order of things, we become less effective with longer prayer. I, I, I don't know if I'm speaking to somebody. But let me tell you, a prayer alone transforms the destiny of a nation. The greatest praying country in, Niger- in the world is our nation. The problem is that we have not allowed prayer to meet with strategy. Yes. We have learned to talk to God without hearing from God and feel good about it. Yes. We have mastered it. We can pray six hours 12 hours and there's no opportunity in that service for the one we spoke to for 12 hours to speak back for 15 minutes. And Jesus warned them, he said, that's the spirit of the Pharisee. They think that they will be heard because they spoke much. And so if you look at your notes and the things that God said to you in the last five years and 10 years, and you don't have another side of your note where you match prophecy with strategy, you're not going anywhere. And you know what will happen? At the end of the day, God will still not be a liar. (laughs) Because he cannot. We have more prophecy than we have strategy. It's like we have, we have eggs, but we don't have sperm. And we're praying for, we're praying for seven children. And we're prophesying to the eggs. There will, there will be only one immaculate. And it was made clear. You are favored amongst all women. Which means you are given access to a realm of life and experience that no woman before you ever had, no woman after you ever, she was sealed with it. So the, you, you which means every other thing she wants in her life, this is not the protocol for it. She should not assume because she got this immaculate one. Yeah, that's why when wine finished, she told them, go and meet the one whose words changes things. Yes. And my heart bleeds because we have, it's not only that we don't have enough strategy. We, we are using prayer to destroy the need for strategy. Have you ever heard Christians on a team given a project to do and they did not get time to prepare for the project so they just gather and hold hands and then they just mumble a few tongues and they say, God will, uh, God will, God is in control. God will, it's only, in, it's only in the Christian folk you see it. When other people don't prepare, they say we are in trouble. When Christians don't prepare, they just hold hands together. Where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am, I am in the midst. Was it God that was giving the project? You think God is not doing his own project? Jesus did not say, my father walks, so I rest. He said, I'm walking because my father is walking. And we don't have strategy. We don't have strategy for anything. We don't have strategy for the next election. We're just waiting to be at the foot of it to pray again. Then get annoyed if it doesn't go our way. We don't have strategy for finance. The only thing we have for finance is a pastor. And I hope that a Sunday service will yield the miracle. We're not the people who know how to take the word with one hand and stay with the word until it gives back to strategy then we enter our sphere and produce. Proverbs chapter 25 Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 2 
one verse of scripture. It says, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of who? To do what? To search out a matter. Mm. Let's read another verse of scripture. Deuteronomy 29, 29. We need to combine these two scriptures so that what we are looking for can emerge. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It says, The secret things belong unto who? But the things which are revealed belong to who? And to who? For how long? That we may do what? All the words of the law. All the words of the law. All the words of the law. What did I tell you about prayer? If you didn't write it down, write it now. Prayer is not in the equation of breakthrough, right? I know it's shattering your head, your tables. It's, it's the reason we're in the same spot. Some of us have told you what doesn't work. We're, we're back. We're sorry. We're apologizing. We're not too big to say sorry. Prayer is not in the breakthrough equation. Prayer is in the revelation and strategy equation. Anything you, any breakthrough you get by prayer, you will lose it very soon. By prayer alone, you will lose it very soon. Because you did not understand the principles that gave birth to it. It will not be reproducible in your life. It's like magic. It won't be sustained. You won't be able to reproduce it. You won't be able to make it happen again. Whereas the plan of God is to bless you and make you a blessing. Which means as he blesses you, he teaches you how blessings happen. So when you meet people, you can reproduce a blessed life in them. Any blessing that you did not understand, you cannot reproduce. That's why we need both prayer and strategy. So that the things that we receive from God, we can become to our generation. Somebody say amen. amen. Do you still like me this morning? <laughs> It says, the sacred things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and our children forever, that we may do all the word of the Lord. Which means, now look at this, both scriptures, Proverbs chapter 25 and Deuteronomy 29, 29, you see one word appearing everywhere. It's the word secret. Secret. It's the glory of God to conceal, to hide, to encrypt a thing, to put it in the dark, to remove it from view, but it is the honor of kings to unravel, to unpack, to unveil, to search it out. Then this scripture says that the things that are secret belong to God. It's the same thing it's saying in another way. But it says when the things are revealed, then they are available and they are now ours, us and our children forever. Which means three activities lead to revelation. There is the God that con conceals, there are the kings that unveil, and then there are the people and their children that receive it forever. So God doesn't deal with the people. God deals with kings. Let me push it. Let me, let me push. Let, let me cut one table. Let me cut one leg from beneath the table. God doesn't talk to men. He talks to kings. It is kings that talk to men. Because it says God conceals. Kings reveal. Then men and their children possess forever. So as long as you are in that group, the scripture declares as us and our children, you have to wait for the God who conceals and the kings that reveal so that you can possess. Which means you will always be on the supply. Let me give you a good example. There are many things we want to say on the social media we cannot because we know we'll be flagged. There are many reasons why we don't like Big Brother Niger. But if we go around talking about what it is not and what damage it does, but we are not unveiling anything that is a worthy substitute 
for the things because people must consume. Then you know what we have done? We have stayed in the realm of us and our children. So it is whatever they reveal that we consume. We don't have a choice in what we consume. The goal of walking with God into hidden treasure is he wants to take you beyond me and my children and he wants to make you a king. So that the only things people consume are the things that you take from God and reveal. This is why, give me your attention, this is why the idea of kingmakers, especially in politics, is a very serious thing. They are not on billboards, they are not on flyers. They are not in campaign groups. But after all the razzmatazz is done in the days and you hear siren in the night, everybody who campaigns is going to the house of the one who has power. Because there is the populace, the us and our children, we are many. But there are the kings that determine the destiny of territories. Have you ever asked yourself why in the presence of the multitude of the Jewish people in captivity, God will have a revelation he wants to give that will transform the destiny of the Jewish people. And rather than talking to powerful people in the spirit like Joseph and Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, God will talk to hidden kings. He will talk to Cyrus. He will talk to Xerxes. He will talk to Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Why will God bypass prophetic people in a territory and speak to the one who spills the blood of virgins in worship of his own God? Why is God interested in making appearances to people who will not bow their knees before him? It is because there is a certain day that will dawn when God wants to turn things around. It will not be who is spiritual only that will matter. It will be those who have access to treasure. Because if the same revelation is given to a Joseph and he sees it and he interprets it, he has no power to change the outcome. So it will be a waste of divine resource. But if the king who has treasure and who, who has the ability to turn the destiny of a place sees it and hears it and believes it, what happens? Everything turns around because in that day, it will no longer be who just has access to God. It will be those who have access to hidden treasure. The Bible says it is to God to conceal. It will be to Christians to unveil. So we will always be on the begging end, except those of us who believe in God also become kings. People who are striving not just for what to receive for them and their children, but they want to get into the game of those that create it, those that unveil it. Yes. If we have a message to pass and Zuckerberg does not like it and he shuts it down and we don't have a network that belongs to us where we can say what God sent us to say, without the fear of who will condition it, then there are no kings amongst us. We are consumers. We are waiting for them to unveil the technology and for us and our children to consume it. Is it hard meat this morning? Yeah. Our journey into God should not just be about what we will consume with our children. We must go to God to say, God, what did you hide? The treasures cannot just be about, about how to live well and how to have another pot belly needing you to go to the gym. No, we must follow God into deep chambers, deep dark chambers and say, Lord, give us of your, of your creative. We, we want to be the people that shape what the generation, we want to, be, we want to shape the options. And then we scream, BBM, BBM, BBM. And there's no Christian program that promotes Christian values that's a safe alternative to the things that we hate. That is darkness crying instead of shout, instead of shining at the light. That's light complaining about the darkness, but refusing to shine into the darkness. 
Beg your pardon. That's light. Complaining about the darkness without shining into the darkness. Many believers were just happy with a greater paycheck. We want more. When God starts to give you visions of how you can create something that other people will now be employed under, you're like, no. No. That is it's unsafe. It's unsafe. Let somebody else be doing the... And let, let us just be receiving us and our children. The day has come because of the scarcity, the pain, and the turmoil that's happening in the world. God is saying, if I will speak to you, you have to upgrade your mentality to the kingdom mentality that creates for God, that has the authority to lift the covers over things God sealed. So if you prayed through this month and believed God for the revelation of hidden treasures and all you got was another car, another job, another house, and then a pot belly, a sagging belly. You know what has happened? You have said the secret things belong to God. We don't care. We are waiting for it to be revealed so that we and our children will enjoy. And kings are, said, kings are saying, no, we will not be consumers. We will follow God. We will produce for an entire generation. What is happening in your heart, in your spirit? What, what kinds of prayer? I, you see, it, it, the way you pray tells us what's happening in your spirit. What are you really asking God for him to do with your life? Take me back to Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. This is not what you would think about God. The Christian God is not this one. The Christian God is only glorified when there is revelation. But this scripture says, God gets glory when there's a ceiling. That that's what gives him glory. The Bible says he rises upon the darkness. He wears the darkness as a, as a, as a, you see, you, your religious God is not, it's not like this. You, so you only celebrate him when something is revealed. Uh, 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 uh. That is the, we and our children. They are the ones that celebrate what is revealed. Kings celebrate what is concealed. Because they know that the real glory of God is not what is available on the surface. It's what is hidden in the deep. So they go with God. When they see something they don't understand, faith rises on their inside. There's another opportunity to get more honor out of life. They're not running away from problems. When they see problems, they call it opportunity. Have you heard the words of Jesus when they told him Lazarus had died? You know the meaning of Lazarus had died? It's over. And he said, no, it's okay. They said, oh God, you don't understand. The ones you woke up, they died. This one is dead and decayed. If you will bring him to life, every man God that took any part must return it to the exact position where they picked it up. It must turn back to what it was before they ate it. They must withdraw all their digestive enzymes. And then you can now do what you did with Jairus' daughter and every other person. This is dead, decay, and the tomb be sealed. Jesus said to them, look at, look at his words, look at his words. He said, our brother is sleeping. Let's go on. So the proof that we're coming to the kingdom, the kingdom standard for our lives, is every time we open the news and they say, this has fallen and this has gone down. Something inside us is waking up. <laughs> Something inside us is waking up. We're like, this is an opportunity. God has concealed. This is an opportunity to unveil and to get honor, to get a reward from our generation. Who are the richest people in our world today? Those who solve a problem we all need. That's it. So we call God to unveil things. This scripture says God is glorified when things are covered. 
So if you were to really pray accurately according to scripture, you would say, God, cover something so I can open it and this world will be in awe. That would be accurate praying. Not God, come and do breakthrough. Uh -uh. It is the glory of God to cover it, but not from you, for you. Because the world will not see your light until it's a game. It's a game between God and kings. Are you still there? Talk to me now. Am I in the right place? It's a game. It's a plan. He will cover it and lead you to the treasure and ask you to uncover it. But as you cover it, all men will see it. Then they will glorify your father. That is where? In heaven. That's the plan. So every time God takes us to covered places, we cry. Every time it looks like we're stuck, we cry. Every time it looks like we're, our backs are against the wall, we cry. We don't know that. That's the first indication of the leadings of the Spirit. The proof that your work with the Holy Spirit is accurate is he takes you where everybody's running away from. When everybody's running away from Goliath, he leads you to run toward Goliath. It is toward the problem. Every leading of God is toward the problem. Write it down. Every leading of God is toward the problem. So every time you pray away problems, you deny yourself of honor. Because it is not the devil that conceals. There are certain things that are concealed in your life. It was God that covered them. I flog these points too much. I was just hoping you will, by some means, understand. If you understand, say, I hear you. Some things will wake you up in the morning with joy and they ask you, oh God, why are you so happy? You say, I found a problem, not a solution. I found a problem and I know who caused the problem. I'm going to meet him. Because I know it's a game. It's a setup for me to be promoted. This is the way of kings. What am I trying to say to you? I'm trying to say to you that there are certain people that God will never give hidden treasures because they do not sustain the mentality that allows God to lead them. They get too scared, they run away. They do not sustain the mentality that allows God to lead them to broken places and covered places and dark places so he can, from that darkness, set them up for glory. It is the same God who covered it that gave honor to those that opened it. Why did he cover it in the first place? It's a game. You're in a game. Everything you call problem is a game. That minus in your account is a game. It's a game. That irreconcilable difference with a spouse is a game. And there are certain things you will never become until you play the game. That not everything that looks dark came from the devil. That God can show up and his cloak will be darkness. He covered it. That if we successfully prayed away every problem, we may, have, we may miss God and not know. We will just be mediocre. We will just notice that we, it's from hand to mouth because we are the consumers. We and our children. Whatever is revealed is for we and our children. We wait for it. If it is not revealed, we die. We are not in the engine room that produces. And yet God is going everywhere covering, covering, hiding things in the dark. And he comes and gives you a promise. I will lead you to hidden treasures. And you expect that after that word, the next thing that should happen is breakthrough. No, research. It's not breakthrough. It's research. It's pondering, it's meditation. It's study, it's going into the books. It's not breakthrough. So let me tell you, this mentality, the kinds of people God never gives treasures in the dark. Because they are the we and our children people. Next Sunday, I'll tell you the mentality of kings, the kinds of people that get honor from uncovering things that look like problems in our society. I, I heard on the news, you may have heard it too. Let's talk about the news. Is that okay? Is our church? Talk to me. Is that okay? I heard that somebody released 100 electric cars for transport. Huh? 
Do you know what that means? Now, while some people were crying, that some things were no longer revealed for them and their children, somebody else found an opportunity. An opportunity that... Do the maths. An opportunity that will make him the kind of person that is actually happy that we went into a recession. I hope you know it's only those who spend in Naira that are not happy. They are acting it with you. Oh, the Naira, the Naira, the Naira. But secretly, they are always calling their FX person. Has it gone up? Because they are waiting for it to get to 1,900 again before they change the dollars in their hand. But they are singing the song of pain with you. But they are secretly calling. Has it gone? Has it, is it still 1,650? Eh? Okay, call me. If you enter 1,7 or 1,8, just call me, call me, call me. They are now doing business with what you call problem. The only Christians that beg are the we and our children. Kings don't beg. Because nothing excites the eagle like the eye on the storm. Nothing wakes him up. He has feathers he will never use until a, until a stormy day. He's built. His battle is his bread. He doesn't really feel satisfied until there's something to conquer. He's king. That's the mentality you're supposed to be living with and should be living with you. That should be your best friend. Number one, let me tell you the kinds of people that never touch treasures. People that don't believe, you have some writing to do. Those that don't believe. Luke chapter one, verse 28, verse 34, and verse 38. Luke 1, 28, 34, 38. People that don't believe. A woman was met, a virgin that was espoused. An angel came to her and said, Hail, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women. And in her head, she asked the why question. Why? Why am I blessed amongst women? Why am I receiving the salutation? It was a why question. Go on. Let's, let's just read it all together. 29, 30. Okay, let, let's go 34. Then she asked a second question. How shall these things be, seeing that I know not a man? So she moved from the why am I favored amongst all women to the how shall the things that are said come to pass? Then after the angel told her what he told her, in verse 38, look at what she said. She said, and Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. 38. Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, and be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Look at what she said. She said, I believe I receive. That's the meaning of behold the handmaiden of the Lord, which means I submit myself to this protocol. Then be it unto me according to the things that you're saying. It means I believe and I receive. Let it happen as was declared. She moved from the why question to the how question. And the moment those two questions were answered, she said, I believe. Many people don't believe. They've not made it through why and how. One of the things that keeps us in our, in our why is the spirit of condemnation. You failed before. You fail again. Nobody spoke to you, but you heard it. Keeps you in circles. Some people don't believe. And that's why they never reach treasures. They believe in God. They just don't believe God will do it for them. So every time they hear somebody else's testimony, they start to struggle with a spirit of jealousy. They are good people, but those who don't believe. We start our journey to divine treasure when we start to believe. 
See, do you have something in your head that you believe God for? That you know that with the current happenings and the logic of your finances, you cannot get there by yourself, but you still have the courage to believe for it. Yes. Those are the people that wake up early in the morning. Because there's something in their soul that there's a pursuit, there's a call of a soul. There's something they are hungry for that they know that the current, the current situation cannot lead to that outcome. So they are depending on the supernatural for it. He says, the, the, the angel told her, he said, the spirit of the Holy Ghost will overshadow you. At this point, the Holy Ghost was not revealed. The Holy Ghost will shadow, overshadow you. And the thing that shall be born will be a holy child. There are portions of your ingenuity and strength that will never wake up until you are in pursuit of something that you cannot get except God gives you, but you are in pursuit anyway. Yes. If you are always cutting your coat according to your size, am I speaking to somebody? You will still be asleep at 10 a.m. Yes. What wakes people up at 4 a.m. is not more discipline than you. It's, there's a fire. Something is on their inside. They, they have been overshadowed by something they have never seen. They are in pursuit of something larger than life. And so it's responsible for the courage they have. It's, it's responsible for the things they will say and the things they will not say. It's responsible for the food they will eat, they will not eat. It's responsible for the places they will go, they will not go. It's responsible for the clothes they will wear and the ones they will... They, their choices are already made because of their pursuit. They don't get to crossroads and they are, mm, should I, should I not? Uh, 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 uh. It has been settled by an encounter. Number two people who never make it to divine treasures, hidden treasures... Are people who are lazy and happy about it. It's like they have a t-shirt on. I'm lazy and it's just okay. <laughs> I saw a t-shirt one day somewhere in the world where I went to. And the t-shirt said, I'm stupid and it's okay. Or a, a Gen Z was wearing it around. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 15. <clears throat> Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. There's something about the temperature of a lazy man that's too cold to go into destiny. The moment they see the first padlock on the treasure, they turn back. They don't have strength to wait. They don't have strength to insist. They don't have strength to persist. They've never believed God for something for five years. And they are still as resolute about it in the fifth year as they were in the first year. They have nothing like that in their life. Their faith only lasts 24 hours. If they get a prophecy on Sunday and by sundown on, on Monday it does not come to pass, then it's over. That's what I mean by laziness. I'm not talking about the decision not to lay your bed. I'm saying that you do not have the heart to stay with God on long-term projects and be as resolute even when everything is crumbling. Today as it was when the word was given to you. I'm speaking about Caleb's. That generation called Caleb. It doesn't grow old because he's not lazy. His heart has found something to live for. And that thing is 40 years old, but it wants it now. It wants it now. And it has no respect for having aged. That spirit of Caleb still wants it now. I heard about a statistic that was done about the world's wealthiest people. And that the world's wealthiest people at an average of about 52 or 60, 60 to 65 years old. But there's a lie that's been told now by your music videos. That you can have the Lambos and the private jets at 25. 25 year old kids are using private jets to do music videos. You know what they are telling you? They are telling you a lie. That if you get to 30 and you don't have a luxury car, you are a failure. 
Whereas, the truth is, the average age of the, of the billion dollars is over 60. So, the moment you get to, over, to 60, God is just preparing to visit you. I, I thought you said you are children of Abraham. Do you know what that means? That your journey starts at 75. And so there's something ignorant about counting your losses at 30 and saying God lied. So when God is just getting ready to say, oh yeah, oh yeah, you're of age now. You've experienced life enough. You know the difference between things. You've, you've, you've had enough experiences. You can manage money. You can manage people. Oh yeah, let's bless you. Tell God it's too late. It's over. So that everything you get now or you don't get is prelim. It's preliminary. And somebody in their mind is saying, ah, pastor, you want me to wait till 60? Before I blow. You don't understand that what I'm telling you is that at 60, you will feel as young as you are now because you found something from God to live for. But because you are still doing we and our children, we are, you cannot see that you can walk with God and start life at 75. And bury all your colleagues, go for all their funerals, and they ask you how far. You say, My life just began. <laughs> They asked Pastor, it was, it was Pastor Podju that gave that analysis about it, and I watched it. We, we, they asked Pastor W.F. Kumi about his, uh, Baba is on crusades. Ah, Baba, you have buried all your mates. You have preached at all their funerals. You literally don't have friends that are your mates. What's your plan? Are you are going on a worldwide crusade? Ah, <laughs> Baba say, <laughs> the best is yet to come. <laughs> The best. Those are men who have their eyes on, their kings, their mindset. Oh, Jesus. The Bible says when, when Moses' work was done, the Bible says he was strong. His eyes were intact. His, for, his natural forces were not abated. Which means if he needed to give birth at 120, he still had enough seed in him. It wasn't with him as it was with men because his spirit was not lazy. He had held on to something for long, so long. He had become so, he had become one with the promise. If I ask some of you to come now and tell me what you're waiting on the Lord for, you start crying. Six months ago, six months, God said, six, I got an opportunity, six months, six months. That's a lazy spirit. Number three. Those who don't look up to anybody never find hidden treasures. Proverbs 11 verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors is safety. Proverbs 15 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 24 verse 6 is loud enough. By wise counsel, you will make war. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Whether you're making war or you have purposes that must not be disappointed or you have, you have need for safety to enter into the things that God has called you to do with the least possible resistance. He says that the prescription is a multitude of counsels, counselors. I've noticed that my generation of people only like people who when you tell them your problem, they give you money. You don't like people who you tell them your problem and they give you counsel. They are the we and our children. Bless me, make a chop. Counsel, counsel. You look onto nobody for counsel. Let me tell you, if you're under 30, you're under 40, you're only as rich as you're surrounded with counselors. Your life has not started. Yes. <laughs> Recently, I just looked around myself and discovered that, ah, I was without counselors. It wasn't purposely. It wasn't because I was trying to be hearty or high-minded. I just looked around myself and everybody who was around me took counsel from me and I took no counsel from any one of them and I knew I was in trouble. I knew I was gone. I knew I was finished. So I started looking for some of, some of my own sons who 
people are blessed and versed in certain things that I need counsel about. And I said, oh God, how are you doing? He said, fine. I said, I'm your spiritual mentor, but musically you are my mentor. I will come to you for counsel. Anything I'm doing for you that will not allow you to do for me is the end of our relationship. I must never become something to you that denies me the opportunity to receive from you. So I have sons who are my counselors. Number what? Are you tired? People don't get to treasures, real hidden treasures. People don't follow God to treasure who have mastered how to sin against their destiny. This is not your popular conversation, but I'll tell you anyway. You see, there are many kinds of sin. There's a sin against God. There's a sin against the brotherhood. It's in scripture. There's a sin against the Holy Spirit. It's in scripture. There's a sin against your own body, but there's also the sin against your destiny. If you sin against your destiny, you will not find hidden treasures. Let me read a scripture to you. First John 5, I think verse 17. 16 and 17, but for the sake of time. First John 5 and verse 17. It says all unrighteousness is sin. General category of sin. But it says that there is a sin that is not unto death. When Jesus died on the cross for you, he took the penalty for your sin against God. He didn't pay for your sin against your own destiny. You can sin against your destiny and be damned for it. The sin against your destiny is what we call missing the mark. Where you have peace with God, but you don't have peace with your own future. You are not in the path that leads to where God ordained for you, although you have peace with God. Peace with God delivers you the final outcome of heaven. Peace with your own destiny gives you dominion on earth. We must be people who after we have found peace with God, we are in the path to destiny. Let me give you a, a good example of sin against your destiny. There is, there is, there is a pattern of diabetes in the men in your household and it's linked to uh, obesity. They're usually so big and then they suffer blood, they suffer diabetes. And you are 10 years from the age when men in your household, the big ones, are diagnosed with diabetes and they ask you what's your best food, you said burger. Is that a sin against God? No. You know what you sinned against? Your ability to be alive long enough to fulfill all God has for you. You sinned against that portion. It's called your destiny. Yes. Those who have, those who sin against their destiny, they have made major promises, but they're not able to run, you know, they have a powerful message, but they kill the horse that carries the message to his destination. They kill it on the road. Number what? Those who treat all men the same will never access hidden treasures. The meaning of treating all men the same is that you truly honor nobody. Everybody has equal access in your life. There are treasures God will hide from you because certain precious things are not for everybody. Every time you open your mouth, everything comes out. You have no... You, you have... There's nothing... You, nothing calibrates your words. You, you can't filter. You don't know who's worthy of what. Numbers chapter 27 verse 20. And thou shalt put some honor, some of thine honor upon him, 
that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient to him. Speaking about Eleazar the priest. And this is God speaking to Moses and saying, some of the honor I gave you, put it on the high priest so that everybody will be obedient. Which means God has distributed different levels of honor to different men. <laughs> and you see, men hide treasures in banks and in, in bunkers now, bunkers. They hide treasures in underground uh, parts of their house. When God hides treasures, he hides them in men. Men are the bank for the treasures of God. God who in sundry times and diverse manners spoke to our fathers by the prophets, as in these last days, spoken to us by Jesus Christ. The man, Jesus, all of the Godhead, fully represented, banked in a mortal frame called Jesus. And he has distributed different levels of his honor on men. The Bible says he ascended on high and he did what? He gave gifts to men. Firstly, apostles and then prophets. He's telling you the pedigree of the different men so that you will accord the right honor. God doesn't give treasures to people who don't understand and practice honor. Number, number what? Those who do not read, find no hidden treasures. Those who don't read. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. Those who do not read, find no hidden treasures. This is a strategy teaching. Those who do not read, find no hidden treasures. Till I come. Give attention to what? And to, and to what? To reading for the purpose but of exhortation. The ability to use the light of what you read to bless others. And for doctrine, reading for the purpose of livelihood. Choices, personal choices and exhortation. The ability to bless others. It says the purpose of reading is both for the people you will bless and the life you will live. That's why people like me, I, I read biochemistry for my first degree, but I don't remember anything. You know why? I read to pass. I didn't read for doctrine. Reading. You got a word from the Lord about something that you don't know anything about and you think it's okay. You're like that guy wearing that t-shirt I saw somewhere in Amsterdam. I'm stupid and it's okay. <laughs> what has the Lord said to you? You know it. What do you know about the word of the Lord? He's the Lord. Let him do what he, he pleases. <laughs> he called you out, poured oil on you, told you, you are the one who will change the financial fortune of your family. If two weeks pass and you have not accumulated seven books on finances, you are not going anywhere. And at the end of the day, God will not be a liar. Yes. Says till I come. Give attention. Attendance, the scripture says. To reading for the purpose of and The next is like it. Those who don't meditate don't access hidden treasures. In other words, those who don't think don't access hidden, hidden treasures. Psalm 63 and verse 5. Psalm 63 and verse 5. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Somebody say amen. My mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Verse 6, when I remember thee upon my bed and I meditate on thee in the night watches, connecting meditation with fatness. I went to the office of one of the greats. I'd heard about it, but I had the privilege of seeing it myself. It was Bishop Oyedepo's office. He had an invitation, four of us. 
And we went in. When I saw the size of the office, the length of the office, the breadth of the office, I asked, why? Your desk is in one corner. Why does the office have to be this long? We were in that office for about 53 minutes in a private meeting with him. And somebody told me, haven't you heard his quotes? He said he needs space to think. That's why his office is this size. You, you just need a table to walk. The says if he sits down and there's not enough space, there are projections in his mind he cannot make. It has created an, an illusion that he's small, so his mind can't travel. That's why we left the studio. <laughs> There's a connection between space. If you in, in the environment of anybody, and every time you're around them, you feel small, you feel choked. They take every conversation from you. You're just trying to talk. They seize every conversation. That person is like a big mind. You are now like a big mind in a small space. Learn from this analogy and end that relationship. End it. Because that person has become to you your small, you are, you are an elephant in the room. If you have places you go that it limits your, you must identify it and block it. Because those who don't have space to meditate, they don't find treasure. He says, if I meditate on your, on your, on you in my bed, in the watches of the night, it says, I'll be satisfied with marrow, with fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful singing. The next one, Acts chapter 8, verse 27. Those who boycott authority, they never get to hidden treasures. Authority. Every man is good for you, young ladies who want to get married, except the one that's not under authority. A nice man is good until you discover he's not under authority. A rich guy is good until you discover he's not, he's not traceable to a spiritual authority, he's not traceable to biological authority, He's not, he, he, he's a, mm, he's, he's his own God. He's a freelancer. He honors all men. Mm. Acts 8 verse 27, it says, And he arose and went and beheld a man of Ethiopia, a man of great, a man of great authority under the Candace queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship, connecting great treasure with great authority. That the queen of Ethiopia gave great treasure to the man with great authority under her. If your journey is to great treasure, you must be somebody who can say, I am a man under authority. Jesus said he never seen great faith in all of Israel, but it was from the lips of the man who says, I'm a man under authority. I say to one to go and he goes. I say to the other to come and he comes. Just speak the word only and there will be a miracle. And Jesus said, this is great faith. So Jesus equates being under authority with great faith. Great faith is not capital letter tongues. And one day when God is going to test the authority on your life, he will hide what you need in people you don't like. (laughs) 
He will give somebody you can give birth to, the scepter to guide your life. He will give them a scepter to guide you and ask you to follow them. People never get to hidden treasures when they do not honor the laws, the laws of giving. The laws of giving. Let me give you this very powerful. Luke chapter 8 and verse 36, popular scriptures. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give to your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. There is a connection between your access to treasure, treasure that comes from men, and your understanding of the law of giving. Look at this scripture. Very Oh, I'm, I'm hoping we get it soon. I'll read it again to you. It says, give it shall be given. You know it. You sing it. You use it before every giving enterprise. But this is what it says. It says, give. It will be given to you. But it says, this is how it will be given to you. It's Luke 8, 38. It shall be given to you good measure. Look at it. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Running over. This is a counsel. This is not just an effect. This is, this is a very instructive counsel. It says when you are giving, remember that his return will be in three ways. It's the mindset with which you give that is guiding. Don't just give. Give with the mentality that what you will get back will come back in a measure that is pressed down. It's a good measure up. It is pressed down. It is shaking together and running over. It says men will give. It says for with the same measure with that you meet without. That's it's the same thing it's saying. Be careful when you give that you meet the demands of giving that allows you be careful of your measure. Not just what you give. The measure. The container with which you give. You know what it's asking you to do? It's asking you to practice three kinds of giving. Upward giving, downward giving, the lateral giving. He's saying give up to authority. Give up to the kingdom. He's saying give down to the poor. He's saying give to the brotherhood. He says because when you are going to get, there will be a measure with which it will go up. It's according to how you prioritize the kingdom that you will get measure. Then there's a measure with which it will go down. That one is responsive to your ability to give to those that are beneath you. Then he says it will be shaking together. It is how your returns will be conditioned by your ability to give to people who are around you. Not because they need, but because giving is a gesture of love. Some people practice upward giving only. Some people hope that their philanthropy to the poor is equal to tithing. They are not aware that all giving doesn't go in the same direction. But they tell you, if I take the tithe, can't I give it to the widows? You, you, you are not aware of the law. Okay. That's how people find treasure. He says if you meet this demand, upward, downward, and fellowship around giving, he says men will be forced to take treasure and give it back to you. You get it. Let's hurry. People don't arrive at treasures, real treasures that God wants to give. Except they keep the law in Amos 3 3. We're rounding up, we're almost there. The scripture says, Can two walk together except they be. What's the next verse? The next verse is a completely different conversation, which means. That question is rhetorical. So the answer is both yes and no. Because verse 4 does not answer verse 3. So verse 3 stands alone. Put us back in verse 3. I just did that for you to confirm. Can two walk together except they be agreed? The answer is yours. Yes, because they can actually walk side by side and look together. But no, because even if they agree to be married, but they are not agreed in purpose, they will end in divorce. There are many people who agree to come to the altar that are not agreed 
He didn't say, can two work together except they agree? He says, can two work together except they be agreed? Which means something vital in the soul must connect them. It's more than the agreement of a handshake. That they are already agreed, they are fused, they have, they have become an alloy of two, two different materials. That if they be not agreed, can they work together? Yes. But can they work together? No. And the same things God wants to give you, he will only give you in the company of others. The Bible says that he that finds a wife obtains favor. So there are measures of favor men don't get until they find a wife. The treasures of favor. The same is true about many different things that we want and how God has conditioned it. The ability to be agreed can lead, can lead us to treasures. The ability to not walk with those with whom we are not agreed can lead us to treasures. Blessed is the man who walks not, who stands not, who sits not. He said, you'll be like a tree that's planted. Ah, the enviable life is connected to company and the spirit of unity. You are under attack if you have money, but the people with whom you live, you are not united. Your money is fleeting. It will destroy you. You're under attack if you think you are fine, you are good, you are spiritual, you have a connection with God. But everybody who's standing around you are having a lot of issues in their spiritual work and you're, you, 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 you have found a way to live with them and ignore the fact that they don't have it straight with God. You, you are a risk in the family. That's why we encourage two people who want to do business, write a contract. House of Kings, did you hear me? Yes, Don't come and say, oh, we belong to the same church. That means you agree. It doesn't mean that you, you are agreed. Well, we're in the same missional community. We're in the same department. We, we, we attend the same telegram prayer, 6 a.m. With pastor on telegram, 6 a.m. We pray from 6 a.m. to 6.30. I see them. I see that that brother is fabulous. He's always on the telegram prayer. Now you commit your, your, your first and only 15 million naira. And when Robert hits the road, you, you, you show up in pastor's office. So you had an agreement, say yes. Show me your agreement. He said, he's our church member. And met him in church. Really? Where did the devil fall from? Was it not the presence of God? Two people want to do business. You want to borrow money to another church member. Write it down. Don't just say, we've agreed about it, we've agreed about it. Hey, you can agree, but you need to be agreed to work together. And agreement is a legal word for document. If there is no document, there is no agreement. Somebody say amen. amen. Now I can move to the next point. Two points to go, we're out of your face. So that God will deliver pastors. Those who pray without planning will never find hidden treasures. Bishop Oedeko says if you pray and you don't plan, you are playing. Praying without planning is playing. That activity, it's not, it's, he says it's equal to play. And those who have plans that they didn't get from the place of prayer, they are planning to fail. Those who pray without planning are playing. But those who plan without prayer, they are, that plan is, is, is organized. The, the end of that plan is failure. Men reach real treasures of life when they have known how to combine prayer with planning. The final one, I'll leave your face for today. Are you bored of me? <laughs> Okay. 
Uh, if you are bored, then your spirit is lazy. You, you, cannot, <laughs> you cannot endure sound doctrine. You are the ones spoken about in the end of time that a crop of Christians will arise that love this present world. <laughs> the final one. People don't reach real treasure who don't invest. And there are misconceptions about investments. Many people think investments is just stocks and shares and how much you have rolling over in some business. But the first investment is the investment of the word of God in yourself. Everything you do with yourself that improves your, your well-being, the quality of your life is an investment. You may have no stock, no shares. If you have books and revelation that defends your conviction, you have investment. If you have paid for conferences that leave you sharper and more accurate about the direction of your destiny that you are going, you have made investment. Yes. If you have paid for mentorship classes that gives you the mount and the wisdom to defend the things that you believe is your career path, you have investments. Those who God trusts with treasures are people who he knows when they get it, they will invest it. They will not squander it. I know what your destiny will be somewhere between Put your ATM card in my hand. I know your destiny. Give me access to your spending habits. I know your destiny. I just need to know two things. Your friends and your spending habits. I can tell you what you'll be in five years. Because the prediction of your future is, is, is in those two things. The people that are allowed around you and the way that you interact with material wealth, the way you spend, it's a testament of your appetite. Your company and your appetite are the two greatest predictions of your destiny. And I can tell your appetite from how you spend, what you spend on. And I can tell your choices, your mindset from those that are around you. If I know what is in your mind and I know what is in your heart, I can tell what is in your life. A life that's, that you plan to, to reach into real treasure must be a life that prioritizes investment. And I'm many clear, I'm not just speaking about finances. I'm asking, how much time do you invest in prayer? We pray eight times a day, 15 minutes every day. Do you have prayer investments or you have plans with no prayer? How much do you invest in others? Are there people whose lives are getting better because of you? You are not necessarily making more money because through them. You are losing money every time you give them something, but their lives are getting, their lives can be said to be the investment of your. If somebody's quality of life is getting better because of you, then you have investments. You have investments. Three kinds of investments from scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse one. Cast your bread upon the waters. After many days you shall find. He says, give a portion to seven, give a portion to eight, for you know it not what evil shall be upon the earth. Verse three, if the clouds be full of rain, it empties itself, they empty themselves upon the earth, and if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. It speaks about water. It said, cast your bread upon the waters, and then it shows us all the kinds of waters. It shows us liquid, it shows us solid it shows us gas because it says cast your bread upon the waters which means what you have your bread your means of sustenance your money your empowerment put it upon the waters but it talks about three kinds of waters it says when the clouds be full of rain it empties itself upon the earth so it's introducing you to what i call liquid solid and gas investments 
Because water rises as vapor, it solidifies it as ice and comes back as liquid. It says, cast your bread upon those three waters. What do I mean by liquid water? You must have an investment that goes into what will produce consistent cash flow. The purpose of that one is not to make you rich, it's to keep you liquid. You must cast your bread upon liquid. You must also have bread that you cast on what you call solid, asset kinds of investments. They don't produce today, but they have, a, they have a possibility of securing the future. They are asset based. You must also have investment that goes into the spirits, <laughs> that goes into gas. You must have investments that are in the realm of things that you cannot feel, touch, or see. You must have investment in things that are electronic. How many of you have, have bought credit card? The days when credit card used to be, uh, 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 I'm talking about credit voucher for recharge card for telecoms, when it used to be in paper or it used to be in card. How many of you bought it those days and then you loaded it? What did you buy? You bought numbers, as intelligent as you are. You paid for somebody to give you a string of connected about 11 numbers. You didn't buy anything. What you bought, you couldn't see. You couldn't feel. Now you can pay for it and you don't get any solid card, but you say you have credit. The ability to make phone calls, nothing solid, nothing you can feel, no commodity, but you paid for an experience. Is that true? Yes. You have investments when you become a good experience. I know certain brothers, but they are not in this church. I also know certain sisters, they are not here. They may be members of this church, but they didn't come today. The reason they are still single is because they are bad experiences. They look good until they open their mouth. Other brothers feel like this lady is a bad experience. And they don't tell them, they tell their pastor. There are some brothers too. The reason they'll be single for a long time is not because God doesn't love them. It's because when the sister looks at them and how unkept they look and the way they've chosen to combine colors, she can't see her future passing through the spectrum of an unkept looking person. He has not invested in becoming an experience. Every time you come around him, He's the only one talking. You have to do mm, mm, because the mouth order you are contending with. <laughs> but his tongues are capital letter. He has investments in prayer, but he's a bad experience. And the people I'm talking about, they are not in church today. Pastor is not talking about you. I'm talking about the person sitting next to you. <laughs> this is the strategy God gave me. I have listed it out to you. This is the way men are bought the ability of God to take them to treasures. This is how people keep themselves in the consumer face of the things that God is doing, the moves of God. Next week, I'm going to share with you how ordinary men become kings and put themselves in that place where they are collaborating, they are gaming with God to shape a generation. Those are the kinds of people I want to be. And there are many treasures that we must find, but we must be people who can sustain the kingdom mentality. Where you're sitting, I want you to say a prayer. You see, this was a discipleship class. This, was, this is what I would typically do on a Wednesday night. But the time has come. Looking at the profundity of prophecies that on your life, it's time for you to start thinking strategy. Bow your heart to the Lord and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive today the strategy that converts prophecy to fulfillment. It takes one secret from God to turn a kiosk to a supermarket. 
It takes one secret from God, one secret upon your temples to move you from where you are. Your marriage will never be the same again. Your job will never be the same again. Your business will never be the same again. The day that you receive from God, the strategy that causes you to escape the ordinary and leave the consumer mentality and add to your prayer a spirit of strategy. Everybody pray the spirit if you can. In the name of Jesus, we receive the strategy for the next level. Stand to your feet. We receive a strategy for the next level. We receive a strategy for the next level. We receive a strategy for the next level. Hold somebody's hand. In the name of Jesus, this house receives a strategy for the next level. Hold somebody's hand. Where two or three are agreed. God is in the midst of us. The person whose hand you're holding is at the verge of a breakthrough. They have prayed, but they need strategy. They need strategy. They need, they need more than capital. They need strategy. I want you to pray in the spirit right now. There's a strategy coming out of heaven. There's a secret numbered out of heaven. There's something we ought to do. There's something we must know because the labor of the fool wearies every one of them because he knoweth not how to enter Enter into the strategy. The Lord is giving strategies for divine health. The Lord is giving strategies for the for financial fortune. The Lord is giving strategy so that one can become a thousand. I'll give you two minutes to lift your voice in this place. Pray until you sense a rain of strategy in this place. Marco Bata Barako Sabakaba. A spirit of strategies release. A spirit of strategies release. Neni Vila Kotaba. In the name of Jesus. Drop that hand, put it on your head. And say, I receive in the name of Jesus a spirit of strategy. This week is the most strategic week in the year yet. Because the spirit of strategy is upon my head. It's upon my temples. I see with the eyes of kings. I hear with the hearing of kings. I know what to do. Somebody prophesy, I know what to do. In the name of Jesus, to come out of recession. I know what to do. To silence the voice of the adversary. I know what to do. To come into what God promised. I know what to do. To enter the promise of marriage. I know what to do. To enter into the promise of joy. I know what to do to enter into the promise of fruitfulness. Declare it. Declare it. Put one hand on your head. It's yours. It's yours. Anoint yourself. Put your hand on your head. Somebody lay hands on the children. There's strategy in this place. And it's not a respecter of age. The spirit of strategy is upon us. Isaiah 11. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me for he hath anointed me. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I will not judge according to the hearing of my ear, but I have a spirit of strategy. In the name of the Lord Jesus, it's upon me. It's upon me. I want you to name the aspect of your life where you want to see a spirit of strategy. Because in seven days you will come back with the song of strategic breakthroughs strategic breakthroughs in the name of Jesus strategic breakthroughs in the name of Jesus lift that hand and give him thanks you've received what you have desired in the name of Jesus you have received it you have received it in Jesus precious name shout amen somebody I prophesy as I am commanded in the name of Jesus let the next seven days be the most strategic days yet of 2024 by the spirit of prophecy I push you into strategy I put you will meet the most strategic people you've ever met you will know the most strategic things you've ever known. You will enter the most strategic places you've ever been. You will give back to the most strategic thing that have ever came from you. Shout amen if you believe it. I declare by prophecy that this will be the week that launches you into strategic breakthroughs. I prophesy in the visions of the night, receive encounters of strategy. Encounters of strategy. Encounters of strategy. Put your hand down. Look at me. The reason I preached to you like this this morning is because God is sending certain problems. 
and God wants you to God wants to make you the solution he doesn't want to solve them for you he wants to make you the solution and so that you don't run away in the day of challenges in the name of Jesus I declare while others run away from a Goliath in this season I declare that you are charging with the stone of victory this week let the Goliath of God fall before you I said they will fall before you. They will fall before you. With the stone of God in your hand, the battles of the past, the warfare of the past, the things that were charging against you and defying the laws of God in your life, in the name of Jesus, we declare they fall flat. Fall flat. Fall flat. In the name of Jesus. What do you call the stone with which David killed Goliath? Power? No. <laughs> when you throw a stone at a man that's covered in armor, huh? when a man is covered in iron and you want to kill him with a stone, what you need is not strength. <laughs> what you need is that your stone will find it through any space in his armor. A spirit of precision. I speak to those of you who are making new projections and charging at new things. In the name of Jesus, let the spirit of precision fall on you. I prophesy to you in the name of Jesus, your stone will not miss its target. I said your stone will not miss its target. Your stone will not miss its target. Great giants will fall by the stone of God in your hand. In the name of Jesus. Lift one hand. Pray for 30 seconds. My stone will not miss its target. The projections I'm making. The plans I'm making. The things I'm aiming at. By a spirit of strategy. I receive precision. Precision. Like never before. I'm hitting my target. Come on, declare it. Somebody's hitting financial targets now. My targets. My, they may look like Goliaths now, but you will hit it. You will hit it. You will hit it. Let the David inside you of you emerge. Online and on site. Prophesy into this week. You're hitting it. You're hitting it. Your relational targets. You're hitting it. Come on, come on. Prophesy. I'm hitting it. I'm hitting it. My career targets, the stone of God is in my hand. I hit my target. Isaiah 11. I hit it. I hit it this week. I'm smashing the goals, smashing the targets. Your spiritual targets, prayer targets, you're smashing them. Your emotional targets, you're smashing them. Targets of your health, you're smashing them. You're hitting it. All Goliaths are falling flat before the stone of God in your hand. Can you take 30 more seconds and be the prophet of your life? Yes, 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 yes. Come on, come on, come on. It's only lazy people that don't have targets. Prophesy, I'm smashing it. I'm hitting it. I'm overcoming it. I'm bringing great things down. Great thresholds are coming down. I'm crossing the line. In the Villa Cota. Shapa Paracate Villa Cosa. Yes. I receive a spirit of courage and strategy. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I declare one last time. The Lord just won't let me stop prophesying because somebody is coming back with a strategy. See, oh, God can lead you in one strategy that will ensure the next 50 years. One strategy from God. One strategy. One strategy. And I prophesy the key to that treasure, the secret to that, that desire that you have, that you have waited on, you have desired, you have prayed on. In the next seven days, receive your key. I prophesy access granted. Some of you have made fresh applications, access granted. Some of you have made international applications, access granted. 
Some of you have asked God for wisdom to navigate this season. Receive the key of wisdom. Receive the key of understanding. Receive the key of counsel. Receive the key of might. And by it, in the name of Jesus, you will explode. You will rise. You will fulfill destiny. And you will be a blessing. In the name of Jesus. Find five people. Prophesy to them. You are blessed and you will be a blessing. You are blessed and you will be a blessing. You are blessed to be a blessing. The spirit of strategy is on your life. You are blessed and you are a blessing. You are a blessing. You are a blessing. Give a shout unto the Lord.